Good afternoon and welcome to Investor Schooling Live, coming to you from Investor Schooling Headquarters. I'm Phil Falcone here with my business partner, Larry Steinhaus. We are the founders of Investor Schooling. Get ready to learn real estate and stock option investing. Call us with your questions now, 855-939-1137. That's 855-939-1137. That's right. You're listening to a live program, so you can call us anytime during our show, and we will take your calls. We'd rather talk to you than talk to each other, is what we're saying. Okay? That's for sure. Investor Schooling is in Langhorne, Pennsylvania, serving the Philadelphia area in a real brick-and-mortar building. What we mean by that is that we don't fly into town and uh, teach you something and then fly out. We're local guys for the Philadelphia area. And we are accessible to our students a minimum of two nights per week. If you want to learn this business about real estate investing and stock option investing, you want to learn it from people who live it every day. Yo, Larry, what's happening? What's happening, Mr. Phil? <laughs> See, because I said, yo, Larry, right? That proves I'm from Philadelphia. Oh, it does? Yeah, it's yo is uh, only to the Philadelphia region. So is that like your, is that like your John or something? Uh, it's just the way the, people talk, man. The, what's, the, what's the story with the John word? The John, John word? John, John, or John, or John. What the hell is that? Y-A-W-N? Oh, John, what the heck John? are you talking about? I don't know what I'm talking about either. All I know is like everybody, talk, everybody talks about it, and, and, and I, I don't know what it means. Somebody uh, one time when I was in Chicago says to me, do you have any kids? And I said, and at the time, I had a four-year-old son. I said, yeah, I got a four-year-old boy. And he goes, a four-year-old what? A four-year-old boy. And he's like, what are you saying? A boy, a boy. What do you, what's B-O-Y? Don't you understand? <laughs> so they apparently said that I have an accent. I told him. People from Philadelphia don't have accents. We speak perfectly. First of all, Phil, you don't have an accent. You have a distinct voice. I mean, come on. Even Dom Giordano said you have a distinct, distinct voice. Yeah, well, but the, there's no accent. You should understand the words coming out of my mouth. I speak perfect Philadelphia English. Perfect Philadelphia English? Yes. Is that an oxymoron? I don't know. I believe it has to be. It really has to be. I, 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 like, I'm just so blown away by the fact that it has to be an oxymoron. All right, so I have a question for you. Oh, hey, wait, somebody actually said it's Jayin, J-A-Y-N. Is that what that is? John? I don't know. I don't you, know. Somebody somebody call in and explain it to us because we have no idea what, what it is. You can call in at 855-939-1137, 855-939-1137, and explain what that means because I have no idea what it means. But I have a question for you, Phil. Did you have a good time yesterday? At the movie premiere? At the movie, yes. The big movie premiere? Yes. Yeah, I had a good time. So what we did for our students yesterday, actually we did it for a bunch of people, not just students. We played... Pacific Heights, which was an awesome movie if you ever wanted to be a landlord and you wanted to know all the problems you could have with being a landlord, this movie portrays those problems. It was all done with a professional tenant who took advantage of, of homeowners or, or landlords and destroyed these people's lives, or at least tried to destroy these people's lives. So at the time that movie was made, which is probably like 25 years ago, um, that movie seemed like a nightmare. That nightmare is happening 400,000 times this uh, year in agree. Philadelphia right now. I agree. With a moratorium on tenants paying rent. Oh, and the tenants are going to renegotiate with you in 2021 uh, to pay you a little bit extra. <laughs> yeah, yeah, come yeah. on. Yeah. Cut me a break. Yeah, they weren't paying before COVID. Yeah. Now they have an excuse not to pay at all. Let me tell you something. Part of having tenants in Philadelphia is that means that at least 20% of your portfolio is flat out not paying you anyway. Yeah, right, yeah, right. I, I, yeah right. I, I know what right. you mean exactly. And right. another 20% right. are paying you extremely late. Uh, and there's you know not a heck of a lot you can do about it except go down to the uh, so-called dungeon. The dungeon? The dungeon. I call it the dungeon. Oh, is, is that where the courthouse is? It's, uh, no, it's the licenses and inspections oh, oh, yeah, okay, office. Okay. Right. And um, mm. it's also the office that you have to file for eviction at. Okay. And, um, and y it's, it's like a dungeon. It really is. It's in the basement of a building on JFK Boulevard, right where the Frank Rizzo statue is, or should I say Was. used to be. Yeah, right. Yeah, where it used to be. Right. It used to be well marked with Frank Rizzo. Now it's well marked. With a 12-foot-deep hole 
on the patio of the building on JFK. Well, you know, at least it's at least it's fitting for the building, I guess. You know, what, what are you going to do? Yeah. So anyway, so this movie, I'm going to tell you right now, if you ever want to be a landlord or if you have had trouble with tenants and, and you want to feel better, watch this movie. And we did a whole discussion. We did a two-hour discussion on the movie afterwards and how to avoid all the problems in the movie. What was your favorite? What was your favorite part of that movie? To me, the when the as soon as the movie started, about five seconds into the movie, the movie is set in San Francisco, and they're planning on, and this couple is planning on becoming landlords. And I thought that's mistake number one. You never want to be a landlord in the most <laughs> liberal city in the United States. Maybe the most liberal city in the Western Hemisphere. Okay? So maybe the most liberal city right. in all of the Americas. Right. Yep, exactly. Okay? So, bingo, that's like super duper breaking, terrible, terrible mistake number one. Before they even looked at a property. Wait a minute, I'm in San Francisco. Maybe I shouldn't buy here. Well, it could have been worse. They could have bought in Philly. I don't think so. You think you don't think so? I think San Francisco could be way worse. I think it could be. It definitely could be way worse. So it's funny. Ed, uh, Ed's putting down Carter Hayes because Carter Hayes was the villain. Actually, that was his fake name in the movie. But yes, that's exactly right. All right, cool. So uh, what exciting stuff are we going to be talking about today, Phil? Yeah, we got a couple of topics we can talk about. One of my mentors used to say, all you need is 4,000 houses. Well, if I had 4,000 houses, I'd be a multimillionaire. Yeah, yeah. But uh, that's not what he means. Here. I know. So I'm going to talk about I know you that speak you know. about that before. I know that you know, but uh, that would be something I was going to talk about today is cool. what does it mean when we say all you need is 4,000 houses? I'm going to explain that coming up soon. And uh, I was also going to say I think it would be nice if you and I would talk about some of the deals of a lifetime that we've done. Now, I do a presentation that some of our students have seen called Multiple Deals of a Lifetime in Only Half a Life. And uh, I could talk a little bit about my multiple deals of a lifetime, and I'd like to hear about Larry's multiple deals of a lifetime. Well, he had two good ones this week. I know he's done a couple, a lot of good yeah. deals in his life. Yeah. Uh, another question we were going to talk about is, is buy and hold the best way to get rich? Do so, that again. Is buy and hold the best way to get rich? Oh, I liked it the second time better. Do it one more time. <laughs> is buy and hold the best way to get rich? No, I still like the second one better. Okay. Uh, another thing we're going to talk about is, what is the entrepreneurial mindset? And how does that help you in life? You don't want to miss that segment, okay? And the most important segment of every show we do is the, the segment that makes you money. It and makes that's you rich or money? Make, no, I'm not talking about getting rich here. I'm talking oh. about making you money, putting okay. bucks in your pocket okay. next week. I'm talking about stock options, our picks of the week. So don't even think about changing the channel because at the end of the show, we're going <laughs> to tell you – what stock options you can invest in to make some ka next week? Hey, guess what? We got somebody on the line who wants to talk to us. We got like a bunch of people on the line, actually. Well, let's we got, wait, I don't know. Let's go to Mike first because he called first, but we also have somebody who wants to explain John to us. But let's go to Mike first. What's up, Mike? Hey, Larry. It's Mike W. from your class. What's going <laughs> you on, doing? man? You're going to tell us what hey. John is? Now, basically, I, this this is something I was probably going to bring up at Mastermind tomorrow, but you know, it might be something that you can answer. Um, guy has a has a condo in Bedminster, New Jersey. Um, he basically bought another one. Um, he's been trying to unload this one. Uh, could be, you know, he basically there's no equity in it. And I'm just wondering, is, is this something that could be a subject to? Um, <laughs> you know, Mike. It looks like you know. You know, if you're going to be a student and you're going to ask a question like that, I'm going to fire you as a student. Of course, it could be a subject too. It could be a wholesale deal. It could be anything. You've given me zero information. Hi, right. I, there's somebody well, who has some fine. house that that I might kind of sort of want to buy, kind of sort of, and okay. and, and, right, uh, and could it I'll, be a subject I'll, too? I'll okay, you... yes. Is that the answer you want? <laughs> All right, no, but here it is. It's, he <laughs> bought it for four twenty nine a year and a half ago. He's already out of the house. He's been trying to sell it for the past six months. I can tell him, Zilla. He's had it. Okay. He now he has it listed as for sale by owner because I don't think he he can make enough money on this thing 
selling it outright without paying out of his own pocket. All right, so you're a student, right? Yeah. So first of all, tell everybody how much you like the school before I berate you over the air. Oh, that's great. Yeah, no, I was going to do that anyway. I, I think this school is freaking awesome. And uh, like I said, uh, I've been more concentrating on stock options. But, uh, you know, like the oh. last last uh, week I made 500 bucks. You know, on on one um on, on you know on okay, one great. book, and cool. so it was nice, yeah. And then I just uh, re up some some more uh, trades, and and just waiting for it to to move on, and then we'll just keep going. All right, so let's but go back uh, to this condo. It, he wants four twenty nine yeah. for it, right? So how much yeah. do you think you can rent this place for? Um, I believe it's about it's in Bedminster, so it's about twenty four hundred. Okay, so what would that tell you alone? That would tell me that, yeah, I'd have to do the math, basically. Wait, wait, yeah. Wait, what? wait, 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 wait. How long have you been a student? It tells me. It tells me. It tells me everything. It tells me everything. Wait, wait, wait. What's the, how long have you been a student? Uh, about Listen, a year. You don't. You don't understand, Mike. If you can't answer this one question, then no one should sign up for investor schooling because if they want to be students like you, I'm going to be really mad. So I need you okay. to come on here and tell me why it's bad. Come on, this rents okay. twenty. What you say, twenty four hundred, and the price is four twenty nine. Yeah. What do we right. do, What do we do in five seconds to know that's a bad deal? You, you run the math. Yeah, you run the numbers. No, no, we don't run the math. It's the one percent rule. One percent rule. Yeah. Okay, what's the one percent rule mean? <laughs> it know. means that Mike doesn't watch the videos and doesn't pay attention in class. That's what it means. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. Why don't you be right, nice well. and tell Mike so, what the damn rule is? So here it is. So here it's the, called the 1% rule, Mike, because, you know, and if you want to go back into your student dashboard and watch the videos on this, you can. The 1% rule says that if you're buying a house for a price, then whatever the price is, the monthly rent needs to be at least 1% of that price. So in other words, if that house is being sold for 429000 the rent would have to be at least for 4300 a month. For you That's to even right. be interested in it. Now, right. if it's really Stop. close, like you know, like uh, you're buying a house for hundred thousand and it's a thousand dollars a month, that would be the one percent rule. But if you buy a house for hundred thousand and they're they're paying nine hundred and fifty and it's a subject to, there may be a reason to still buy it. But with that far okay. money off, I mean, all you're doing is going to be taking three thousand. I'm sorry, about two thousand dollars out of your pocket every month to pay for that. Is that something you want to do? Right. No. Okay. All right. Now. Right, remember thanks. this, that you just on the air made us look bad. So I'm going to make sure I remember that tomorrow night when you show up for the mastermind meeting. <laughs> <laughs> but see, that's, but that's one of the good things about your school, right, is that you have, you hold us accountable. You do that. That's absolutely. And that, absolutely that's, what I, that's what I like about it. And like I said, uh, we do, as students, we do dumb things. And then we have somebody who tells us. <laughs> You know what we're doing, stupid, and and we learn from it. And uh, <laughs> all right, Larry, I'm I'm sorry. And by the I way, came and in by more way everybody out there, this is our exact style. This is exactly what you're gonna get when you come to the school. <laughs> it, it is true, and you will learn. All right, thank you guys. Have, He'll never have a great forget show. that. All right, guys. No, I won't. Get Ed thank from you. Delco's on hold. Why don't we uh, pull I, I, him up? Uh, Ed from Delco, right? All right, let's do it. Ed, what's John? Hey, now this is Ed Dowling. How are you? Hey, what's going on, man? What's up, another, st another student. So, did you did you know what the one so percent rule was? <laughs> yes, I I know, and I was screaming it, but you couldn't. Oh, hear were me. you okay? Good. At least okay. I just want to make sure that we're teaching something that somebody remembers. So John is anything and everything. Anything can be a John, and everything can be a John. You so, you could be the John. The house you're looking at could be a John. The movie yesterday was the John. It, it's just, it could fit in anywhere. It, it's, there's, there's like Use another it. word that's out there. Wait a minute, there. wait a minute. Use it in a sentence, Ed. Phil Falcone is the John. So it sounds like the other word that I I've often use. I've lived in Philadelphia my whole life, and I've never heard anyone say <laughs> that. Not even once. So well, I don't know. I think, this is, I think this is some kind of like Joe Biden Delaware thing. <laughs> it has nothing to do with Philadelphia. And, and so tell you the truth, the to I tell if a man is really from Philadelphia, it's if he can use the F word twice in one sentence, and it actually w makes sense. <laughs> you can't use that word when you're beefed out. 
So it's so it's the four letter word with a, with a J instead of an F. Uh, is that it's a story? The John. The oh, house I, I looked at was the John. I'm sorry, I'm not buying into it. We, you know, Phil's not buying All into right. it, and like, and Phil, and you have to understand one thing: if Phil's not buying into it, and he he sounds like a mafioso shyster. He must know what he's talking about. I was born in Philly and lived there for most of my life. I know what the heck Philadelphian people say, and I have never heard that. So here's my... Here's if my... any more of you fake Philadelphia people want to call up and argue with me about it, you do it. The phone number is 855-939-1137. 855-939-1137. Yeah, and if, you know, if anybody it else is, uses the word John... Thing. Here, here's my thought about it. No more. All We're right. done with it. All right. Thanks, so, Ed. We appreciate so it, man. On a, yeah. on, a serious, ahead, you... on a serious note, can I? One more thing. Okay. The uh, BRRR method. Oh, my God. I, the, I get it. The how to get and I understand method? it. But <laughs> exactly. Could you could you touch on that of how, uh, how this you can be? Go through the, you're going to make me go through the Burr and method and then tell you why it's the worst thing you could ever do. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll put it on the bottom of the list. Yeah, okay, okay? we'll do that. And after we're done talking about the topics of the day and we have nothing else to okay. talk about and we can't think of nothing else interesting, maybe we'll touch on right, it. Right, and if none of our students call us and, you know, with, with uh, you know, trying to explain John and tell us that they don't know what the 1% rule is after a year, we'll, we'll explain we'll explain it. All right, so let's talk hey, about. I'll, I'll tune in. At, I'll tune in at four oh five for that. Okay. <laughs> okay, you do that. You know what? Hang up on. Yeah, really. Cut him off. Cut him off. Cut him off. Hey, you know, I don't want any Delco people telling me how you're supposed to talk in Philadelphia. Some kind of thing you and Joe Biden worked out. We don't want to hear about it in the city. He's okay. still there. Get rid of him, John. Get ditch, rid of him. Ditch that guy, John. What are you doing? Going really? to the bathroom? Wait, he's not. He's not even listening to us. All right, so let's talk about. One of my mentors used to say, all you need is 4,000 houses. So what did he mean by that? He didn't mean that you had to own 4,000 houses. However, if, if you, you did, if you that would did, be awesome. If you did, you would be one very wealthy man. Okay? That's for sure. Or a lady. Right? What my mentor meant by that was, all you need is 4,000 houses. Determine, look in the city that you live in, wherever it is that you live, even if it's like, say, some rotten place like Delaware, okay? You live in Delaware. You pick 4,000 houses in these neighborhoods that are houses that you want to buy. Preferably, they're going to be houses that are inexpensive, and single-family homes would be wonderful, but they don't have to be. It, what's very important is that they're inexpensive because wheeling and dealing, especially if you're going to do some wholesale deals, you want to have your houses be cheap. You don't want to be dealing in $600,000 houses. You want to be dealing in something under, say, quarter of a million, okay? And these 4,000 houses could be preferably located close to where you live. So if you were to continually go and knock on doors, driving for dollars, send out marketing, meet people, talk to people constantly in these 4,000 houses neighborhoods that you have identified, you want it to be close to where you live so you can work these neighborhoods easily, understanding the fact that you're going to end up owning a bunch of these houses in this in this 4,000 houses that you've, pro you've chosen because you're going to work these neighborhoods your entire life. And what my mentor meant was you don't need 12,000 houses. You don't need 50,000 houses. You just need 4,000 houses. And then you work those neighborhoods, meaning working it, meaning sending them postcards, sending them letters, cold calling them, driving for dollars, meeting people in these neighborhoods, constantly working it to the point where you're trying to buy houses in that neighborhood. And if you buy houses consistently in the same neighborhood your entire career, guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to make less mistakes. You're going to make a lot more money because you're going to immediately know when you see a property for sale or you drive by it or you see it on the MLS – you're going to know instantly whether or not that house is a deal because you are so intimately familiar with the neighborhoods that you have pinpointed your 4,000 houses. And that's what my mentor meant. What do you think about that, Larry? I, I think it's awesome. But, you know, we got Sal on the line. I'm going to guess this is Sal from our school. Hey, Sal, you there? Yes. I knew it was you. I could yeah. tell by that voice. Yeah. What's How's going, it going on, Sal? Do you, do you know what the 1% rule is? Yes, I do. 
Okay, good, because I just want to make sure that I actually just made an offer on a house, and I didn't get it. But okay. uh, I know 1% rule. It's got to be 1% of the monthly rent. It's got to be 1% of what you pay for the house. Yeah, a minimum, right, exactly. So I, I know we're going to yeah. have to get a hold of Mike, and we're going to have to say, hey, Mike, you know, you haven't been paying attention. Because everybody yeah. else seems to know what it is. All right. Yes. What else is going on, man? All right. I just wanted to know where you guys see the um, real estate market going in the next six months because it seems like all these houses around here, everybody's overpaying for them like twenty or thirty thousand dollars more. Is it, you're going to see like a repeat of two thousand eight? Because I remember that was what was going on in two thousand eight. What do you think <laughs> is going to happen? You, you you want my you want my explanation of two thousand eight and why we're going to have a repeat of two thousand eight? Yes. All right. So here's the deal. So 2008 was caused by 9-11. It was caused by okay. 2001, 9-11. This is what happened. 9-11, first of all, if you remember, in 2001, we were heading into a, you know, not a recession, but a normal downturn. It was the normal downturn. It was just like, you know, what happens is houses go up, then they go down. It happens about every seven or eight years, and it's normal. And in 2001, we were heading yeah. into the normal downturn. And all of a sudden, 9-11 yeah. ha- ha- comes, and, you know, it's, it's catastrophe, disaster. It's, it's horrible. And the government didn't want the stock market to crash, didn't want the housing market to crash, didn't want us to go into a recession. So what they did was they flooded us with money. I mean, all this money was available to, to homeowners, and, and all, I mean, and it was available to banks. And it was just like insane amount of money. In fact, it's worse now, and I'll explain that in a minute. So what happened okay. was we didn't get our normal downturn. Come 2008, se- about seven years later, we're going to have our, normal, our next normal downturn. Unfortunately, that normal downturn now had to include the first normal downturn that we didn't get. So that's why it hit us so badly. This year, 2020, would have been around the normal downtime. 2020, 2021 would have been the normal downturn. Here comes COVID. And guess what happens? The government once again floods us with money. Now, they flooded us with more money this time. And not only did they flood us with more money this time, but banks decided to do things like forbearances and doing everything they can to keep this disaster from happening. And now we're going to have to pay that price. And I'm going to guess that price is going to be paid somewhere around 2026, 2027. So be prepared for it. At the same time, buy houses like crazy now. Make sure that your rent covers your your mortgage or or your payment or whatever it is that you have. And don't even worry about it. Just sit back and wait because this is going to be some really good times the next two or three years, and and we'll see what will happen. It'll start to it'll start to go down. It'll start to crash, and when it really does crash, as long as you're sitting pretty, you have money in IRAs, you have money in life insurance or four hundred one ks, or you have money in houses, and you have silver and gold, you will be fine. Not only will you be fine, you'll be the only one with money, and you'll be able to take advantage of twenty twenty five, twenty twenty six when all this happens. And if you guys want to record oh, okay. this and play this back in twenty twenty five, twenty twenty six. It would be an interesting playback. Well, that's an interesting okay. explanation of what happened. So that's like, when you think like the housing market's going to uh, basically go down back in that. 2025. Well, hold on, Sal. Phil wants to say something. Okay. Yes. So that's an interesting explanation that you have, Larry, but I think you left out a lot of important things. Like how about the, uh, the NAACP suing the United States government, saying that the mortgage companies are, uh, you know, racially not uh, giving fair opportunities to people, which made them lower the standards. The mortgage companies were forced oh, oh, to oh, lower you mean, Oh, you mean before, before 2008? Before, uh, before the crash. Before okay? 2008, yeah, The mortgage right, okay, companies yeah, sure. were forced yeah, to yeah. change their guidelines right. to accept people who weren't qualified for loans, which caused uh, w- w- you know subprime mortgages to, to go through the roof. Everybody was get, If you could fog a mirror, you could get a mortgage. I used to get 100% of my money from banks yep. pro- from 1989 to 2008. 100%. I was never denied a loan. All I had to do was ask for it. After 2008, I couldn't get a bank loan. I did two bank loans since in the last 12 years. Two bank loans. Okay? I understand. It, it all had yeah. to do with those stupid rules. Well, there was more to it than just the WCP. There okay, was also well, the know. banks. The banks, you know, they 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 did their own thing. They, the government they was fo- the government right. created the problem, and hence 
the government is always responsible for whatever the biggest problems are. Well, I think it's I think it's businesses that are responsible. I think the banks were responsible for their own downfall in that time. However, it really doesn't matter. You know, they gave mortgages to people who couldn't afford them. But here's what's happening: they're giving mortgages again to people who can't afford them, and that's and that's what's going on. We need to we need to go to yes, that I see that say? also. Yeah, that's all right. Hey, Sal, I love it, man. Oh, Ed Dowling yeah. saying the Community Reinvestment Act is what you're talking about. All right, so we'll hopefully we'll see you in class tomorrow night, and uh, yes. we're gonna move to the we're gonna move to the next topic, man. What do we got? All next, right, Chris? guys, take it easy. See you, man. What do we got next, Phil? We, should we should we tell everybody how they can get a hold of us since they've been listening on the radio for to this awesome show? Why don't we uh, Why don't we give out the phone number then? Well, it, also <laughs> they can go to investorschooling dot com and they can get a free class this Thursday. Is that class complimentary? I, it's, it's complimentary and free. That's like that's like. Two free classes. Yeah, you can get a free class and a complimentary class all at the same time. <laughs> and you go to investorschooling.com. We have classes online. We have classes in person. The in-person classes are better, I'm telling you now. And uh, it's so much fun. It really is a great time. So investorschooling.com. If you have any questions right now and, you know, if you want to be someone who's not a student, that's cool. If you want to be a student, that's cool, too. You can call in at 855-939-1137, 855-939-1137, and talk to us because we know what we're talking about. And even if we don't, it's not, we sound like we do. Yeah, that's the most important part. Hey, why don't you go to commercial break? Because uh, I'd like to possibly find some tenants on the next two minutes. <laughs> John? Guys, what's up, everybody? It's Larry Steinhaus and Phil Falcone, and we are here at Investor Schooling Live. And we are here talking about real estate, stock options, making money, making your life better financially. The phone number to call in is 855-939-1137. And by the way, if you're listening to another station, if you're not listening to us live, we, we go live on WPHT between uh, 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock on Sundays. And if it's not that time, you can still call us at 855-939-1137, and I will personally answer the phone and personally answer your question. So 855-939-1137, you can call in right now, or you can call in later. Oh, Ed Dowling lets us know on Facebook that investor schooling is the John. Cool. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing because it can mean anything. That don't make sense to everyone in Delaware. <laughs> in Delaware. <laughs> okay, so, Larry, I want to talk about have you done what you classify as a deal of a lifetime? Why don't you tell me oh. about one of your deals of a lifetime? I've done several deals of a lifetime. Yeah, I'm sure we both have. Yeah. But I'd like to hear about one of yours today. So my favorite deal of a lifetime continu continues to be the – the first subject two deal that I ever did, and it was funny because it was uh, what thirteen years ago, I guess it was. Maybe I don't even know anymore. It's, a, it's been a long time since I did this deal, and it was I was sitting in a seminar, and the seminar was held by somebody I know pretty well right now. I didn't know him that well then, but I know him pretty well. Who was that? That seminar that I was sitting in, Phil? Uh, I believe it was a seminar I was teaching. It was a <laughs> seminar you were teaching, and it was about subject two. <laughs> And I'm listening to Phil and, uh, you know, a couple other people talking about this process of buying houses, which is called subject two, which is basically taking over their mortgage payments. And I'm listening there. And I, I got to tell you, Phil, and you know this. You've heard this story a million times. I'm listening to Phil and I'm listening to uh, the other speaker and they're saying how you could take over mortgage payments. And I'm going, who the heck in the world would ever let somebody take over their mortgage payment, especially when the fact that they're they're, that person's name stays on a mortgage? Well, anyway, uh, about three weeks later. I'm out with a client because I was in the IT. I was in the IT business at the, at the time, and the person I was with, you know, we we had talked before. She knew I knew a little bit about real estate, and she had this problem. She had a property, and it was a two-family house, and it had a commercial pizzeria attached to it, and she didn't know what to do with it. Now, remember, this is like right, you know, this is recession time. This is right around recession time where she's hurting and she she can't sell it. She doesn't know what to do. She owed a hundred and I think it was one hundred and seventy thousand on it. And she had it listed with a realtor for 170000 And I looked at her and I said, look, even if you're selling at full price, you're going to have to come to the table with money. And she goes, I know. I don't care. My husband won't divorce me unless we sell this property. So I remembered Phil saying something like, hey, if you could, if, you know, you could take over the property. You, don't, you take over their mortgage payment. So I looked at her and I said, hey, what if I take over your mortgage payment, take over the property, and you never have to worry about it any, again? Well, long story short, I ended up make, buying that property for $1,724 out of my pocket. 
that property is now worth somewhere near around three, three ten. Um, I have over one hundred eighty thousand dollars equity in it. I've been paying down the mortgage that she had on it for a long, long time. I'm making somewhere near twelve hundred dollars a month now in that property. It's pretty amazing. At first, I was making four hundred dollars a month. Now I'm making twelve hundred dollars a month, and I, I will tell you, tell you, it's absolutely the best property. And it was a great experience because I've done several subject to, including one that I just did on Friday, which was an awesome deal as well. I bought a nice three thousand square foot house, and I bought it subject to my my uh, this tenants in there. I'll be making somewhere near seven or eight hundred dollars a month on that one, and it's just great. I just take over the property. It cost me. So I had to go to closing. Actually, it's a funny story. I'll have to explain this one next week, how I actually went to closing with no money. But I had to go to closing. I had to acquire it with $7,600. Uh, the tenants immediately gave me a check for $3,400. So I don't – I mean, what did it cost me? $3,500 to buy a property? It cost me nothing. Yeah, that's a good deal. And uh, one of the things – Larry was one of my first students who actually – yeah, he, he said nobody would ever do this, but like a month <laughs> later he came back and he had already done one. Yeah. Okay, so I was like, great, like, hey, I like this guy, right? Because yes. Because and so the interesting part is I had been investing in real estate since I was eighteen years old. I just never heard of subject two before. Yeah, but what was cool about it was you were standing up saying nobody would ever do that's that, right. but then yeah. you actually went out and tried it and exactly. it worked. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And that's what's that's what's great, right? So. Um, I'm not going to talk about any uh, deals of a lifetime right now because I actually haven't done that presentation in quite a while. And I was thinking maybe I'll do it Thursday night. I think that's a great idea. So, so if you come to investor schooling, oh, you're going to say that? You yeah, say it. I was just going to drop a little, uh, a little hook. If you're interested in coming to investor schooling this Thursday night, I am going to tell you, and that's at 7 p.m. at investor schooling, okay, 7 p.m. this Thursday night, I bought a building for $2.1 million dollars. With ten thousand dollars in the bank, and I'm going to tell that story on Thursday night. So get your butt to investor schooling this Thursday night, and I'll teach you something yeah. really worth knowing. Yeah, that's a, that's a great story. I love that. Story. That's an awesome story. Yeah, it is. It's uh, it's one of the best stories ever. So, um, how about we talk a little bit about is buy and hold the best way to get rich? Do it one more time. Uh, I don't want to do it. Again. You don't want to do it again. Four oh. times I've already done. It. You, yeah, but you know, I, I still liked it the second time you said it. You know, in the first half. Well, hour. good. Go back over the recording. Uh, and yeah, you can I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to pull that out of recording and, and, and put that in there definitely. All right. So, do Larry, do you believe that buying and holding real estate is still the best way to get rich? So it is absolutely the best way to get rich, and it's absolutely the best way to secure your retirement. You know, look, we, there's no such thing as pensions anymore and even if they are they're not enough money i mean you know look, phil and i we we are entrepreneurs we do not have a pension from a company and we need to make sure that we can go through retirement or if anything happens to us we can get paid every month and that's what buy and hold does it makes sure that you get paid every month i don't care how much my properties are worth all i care about is how, what my net income is after i pay the bills on the properties that's more important to me than anything yeah the truth is is that real estate is a tremendous vehicle to provide you income in the future. I'll just give you one real quick example. I have an office building right now that I own that uh, is more than half paid off, okay? And this office building has a $9,500 mortgage payment a month. Now, I'm already pulling money out of this office building month after month after month, right? I'm making money from this building in positive cash flow. But in about... Nine short years, that $9,500 a month payment will be paid off. So my income stream will be boosted by $120,000 a year. And keep in mind, this is just one building that I own. Just one building, right? <laughs> Can you imagine? I have, I have more than yeah. one commercial property, all right? It just gives you an idea of... If you only bought one commercial property in your life and managed it and paid it off and managed it to the best of your ability, that alone could be a retirement plan you could theoretically live off of the rest of your life. And that is why it is so important that you buy real estate, you hold on to real estate, and you let it and you let it mature. And when it matures, your, <laughs> your net worth is fantastic. Plus, here's another cool thing. 
Bill, and I think you know that. Let's say you needed some chunky money. I know you like that word, chunky money. You need a hundred grand. And you have in that building, you have, I don't know, you have $2 million of equity. Let's forget it. Let's even give it a bigger number. Let's use a half a million dollars. And you have $2 million of equity, even in that building now, which I think you probably have about $2 million of equity. I probably right have about a million ballpark. Okay, great. Yeah. So you need a half a million dollars right now. Something happened, whatever it is. Or you want to buy another building. Right. With a or, phone call to a bank. Or whatever, right. Instead, Refi so, the loan and boom. Right. You could sell the building, which is dumb. That would be the dumbest thing right. I could do. Or you could just borrow the money out of the building. And you could use that building somewhere. Now, here's the question, Phil. How much taxes do you pay on that half a million dollars if you borrow the money? Regardless of whether I borrowed half a million more or 200000 or 700000 the answer to your question is zero taxes. That's because correct. you do not pay taxes on a loan. That's correct. And you could borrow, I mean, you could borrow money off your buildings. For the, actually, with the amount of buildings that you and I have, we could probably borrow money off our buildings for the rest of our lives, never pay taxes on them, and never have to worry about them. I mean, that's that's just fantastic. The uh, I can tell you straight up that I've been in this business for 32 years as a real estate investor, and there is I know of nothing that comes anywhere close to the positive impacts financially on your life that real estate will have. Even if you... Don't visualize yourself being able to be a real estate investor. I can promise you this. If you just bought two houses a year for the rest of your life, I could easily make you a multimillionaire exactly. from that. Even if you're 60 years old, I could still do it. And all they need to do is what? Come to Investor Schooling, 7 p.m. this Thursday night, <laughs> and you'll hear a story about a guy, me, who bought a building for $2.1 million with $10,000 in the bank. If you think it's not possible, you come and listen to my story, and you'll learn a little bit about how the real estate world works and some of the amazing things you can do. Why don't we... Well, I have a question for you, Phil. Go ahead. And, you know, so everybody listening to this, by the way, you can go to investorschooling.com, or you can call in right now, 855-939-1137, 855-939-1137. So, Phil, you and I, we're rich. We don't have to work anymore. But how can that? How can it be that we have a school called Investor Schooling that we teach people to do this if we don't need the money? Why? Do, why would we do such a thing? Well, you know, some sometimes you'll meet people who have a passion for teaching, and if we can make some money teaching people, that's a wonderful thing. But we also, I don't think I could ever stop being a real estate investor. I just can't. I couldn't stop if I wanted to. I mean, even if I was in jail, I could still become a – I could still do real estate. Well, could, you're not saying you'd go to jail, are you? I'm saying I know a guy who went to jail who was right. a professional real estate investor, and you know what he did when he was in jail? Bought real estate. He, he hand-wrote marketing letters and mailed them wow. out every day. That's yes. amazing. And the day he got out of prison, he bought a commercial property that he had all locked up. That's pretty well. That's pretty well. You know, I'd like yeah. to, I don't know who that is. Don't I w- don't say I'll say is. his name. It doesn't matter. But I, I'd, I'd like to have him in class one day to teach us that oh story. Oh, my God. I'd love to. But he's, be great. he's one of these guys that charges like $20,000 to speak. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. He is amazing, though. That's awesome. I'll tell man. you about that's him off off the air. Cool. That's cool. That's excellent. Yeah. yeah. So so that's why we do it. We do it because we love it. Look. And here's the other thing. You know, like people are like, well, why do you charge? Why do we charge, Phil? What do we charge? Why do we charge to teach people how to do this? Uh, because we're capitalists. Of course, of course. <laughs> Speaking but the of knowledge cap- you get is well worth more than than our our, our school costs o- over and over again. It is. I believe so. I certainly hope so. I, and we have 110 students who gave us five star Google reviews that agree with us. Well, that's pretty good. So if you go to Google, you can actually see that we have five star Google reviews, except for one. Did you know we now have a negative review? Well, that's okay. One good, one bad one. No, is good. I'm actually really happy that we have a negative review because it proves the other ones are real. Mm-hmm. But the interesting story is the guy who left that review doesn't show up for class, doesn't participate in class, looks at his phone when he's in class, doesn't do anything. He's almost like Mike Wiederman, but he's not. <laughs> I'm not going to pick on Mike <laughs> Wiederman. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the entrepreneurial mindset. Okay. One of the things that that you'll learn when you're when you come to investor schooling when you get your butt to investor schooling, one thing you'll learn is 
We are true blue professional entrepreneurs and have been for a long time, okay? And there's a certain mindset that entrepreneurs have. One of the things that you'll notice real quick is entrepreneurs tend to make really quick decisions. And they don't often change their minds That's easily. Correct. So you'll, you'll notice, you'll ask them a question, and most entrepreneurs will spit out the answer very quickly. And if you are on the other side of the table and you disagree with that entrepreneur, you may have a heck of a time getting them to change their mind because most entrepreneurs have made up their mind for decades now about how they feel about certain things, okay? Uh, another trait that you'll see about entrepreneurs is they don't follow the crowd. They tend to be individuals who blaze new trails. And that is definitely the kind of stuff that we talk about here. We're always talking about how to get around everything, okay? So whatever laws or rules, a, maybe a condo association creates some new rules that get in our way, or politicians create laws that are difficult to make work under the current circumstances. Entrepreneurs are famous for finding a way to get around that, to embrace right. the Not chaos. Not break the law, but get around it. Yeah, that's, get, a, that's important. Well, get around it, sure. That's what I'm talking about. You know, you're bending it. You're yes. finding a way to get around it, okay? And that's, uh, that's one of the things that you'll learn as you come here at the school for a while. People will raise their hand and go, well, what about this problem? And, and our answer is often... Been there, done that. Here's really? what you do. Really? Right? Here's how you get around that issue. Boom. Okay? What I've do you got, think? I've got a great example of how we bend the rules. Let's hear about it. You know, when you walk into our door, there's a sign on our door that says, masks are optional. Because we believe that this is America, and you have the freedom to walk into a place that masks are optional. Now, I'm sitting here, and I'm screaming that, and if Governor Wolf is finally listening, I've been inviting Governor Wolf to our to learn how to invest in real estate for the longest time. In fact, if Governor Wolf is listening, I will be more than happy to sell his house when he gets thrown out of this state because he, no one wants, to, wants him here anymore. I'll be more than happy to sell his house for free. I won't even take a commission. <laughs> you got any other traits that entrepreneurs might do? Other traits? Yeah, you want me to tell you a couple more? All right, you didn't like that one, huh? No, I like that one. Okay. How about ignoring naysaying? Entrepreneurs typically will not allow anybody to to tell them that they can't do what they know they can do. That's right? correct. But people who don't do anything are always the ones that want to tell the entrepreneurs <laughs> that they can't do it. Okay. I, for one, just don't even hear that stuff anymore. I mean, tell me I can't do something, it infuriates me, right? It really does. What hey, do look out the window. Uh-oh, it's Governor Wolf. I think it's Governor Wolf. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to talk about him. Or his, uh, his masculine-looking uh, assistant. Masculine. Masculine-looking assistant. Is that M-A-S-K, Euler? Look, I don't want to talk about it. All right. All right. Where are we going with this? Let's keep going. Oh, wait, wait, let's do this real quick. You can attend a free class at VersusSchooling.com. You can show up with a mask, without a mask. You can show up online or not online, whatever you want. And also, if you have any questions, you can call in right now at 855-939-1137. Uh, you know what? Why don't we talk a little bit about the stock market? Why don't we talk about your stock option picks? I'd like to start right. doing it with a little, a little more time in case yeah. somebody wants to call, I in. Agree. call in. So here's the intro for our stock options. Stock options searching. Stock options sultan. All right. I, I, I swear, I just turned on CNBC because I wanted to pull out some things. And what does the headline say? Trump says Rudy Giuliano has been tested positive for coronavirus. Anybody want to send him a tissue? Because that's probably what he needs. Anyway, let's get into reality here. So I'm finding this very, very interesting. It seems that when I mention stocks on this show, that week they rally, or they do exactly what I said they were going to do. Last week we talked about Nicola, not Nikolai, Nicola. Is Thank that right? You. Nicola. Thank you. It's better. Yeah, Phil, Phil yelled at me because I called, kept calling it Nikolai instead of Nicola. So it's Nicola, and I said if it hits 22, buy it. And then I even said if it hits 17, buy more. 
The crazy part was on Monday it hit 22, and on Tuesday it hit 17. <laughs> and it bounced right back. Let me ask you something, Larry. What is the, what is the earliest you can get extended hour quotes on your stock option? Um, you mean the, for the stock option or for the, for the stock option? You can. It, it literally stops at 430. So it just for the stock stops. option price, it stops Yeah, at but you can hit extended hours on CNBC and you get updated figures. You're talking about the stock price, not the option price. Okay. And that's that's the difference. So depending on the service you have, you can get you can get you can actually get the price of stock. CNBC won't give it to you. But you so you're saying that the the extended hours section of CNBC's website does not give you accurate representation? No, no, I, I'm saying that that it's a di it, you need a different subscription. Now it'll typically be till about six o'clock. Where the extended hours will be will be correct, and then it just locks up and it yeah, stops. Yeah, then it just stops, right? Yeah, it stops and then it starts again in the, in the morning, like yeah. what, an hour before the market opens? Well, no, no, it's actually a lot earlier. It, it, actually, I six a.m. right? Six a.m. seems to be the most accurate number, like you know, real number. Right. But around five o'clock, you'll actually see a difference. You'll see a change. You'll see an up or down number. It may not be the most accurate number, but six o'clock in the morning is definitely when you can look on and go, "Ooh, this looks good. Ooh, this looks terrible." So it, and again, you know, from six to nine thirty, a lot of things happen. A lot of things could happen. So it doesn't even matter what it says at six o'clock. First of all, whatever it says at six o'clock, there's nothing you can do about it anyway because you're in stock options, which you can only trade between uh, nine thirty uh, between uh, nine thirty and four o'clock anyway. All right. So let's get into the picks. All right. So Nikola still, I still like it. Uh, uh, right now, it's sitting right around nineteen. I still like it. I still think it's a good play. So J Nug, we mentioned J Nug last week, and sure enough, J Nug. Jumped up about 10, 11 points, and it's creeped down just a little bit. But I still think it. By the way, I said last week, I said J Nug anything in the 90s was a play. And if you ha weren't already in it and you played it on Monday, you loved me because by the end of the week, it was up 11 points and it came back a little bit. But that would have been an awesome stock option play, especially for a week. That would have been fantastic. So, anyway, so J Nug is sitting around 107, 107 and a half right now. And I like, I still like it. The problem, the question is when. Um, J Nug will probably be a 140, 150. I just don't know when. It's kind of it's kind of a rough it's a rough thing to to guesstimate because J Nug is so volatile that it could be by the end of next week it could be 92 again or it could be 150. By the way, if it's 150 by the end of next week, I will have a better than 193 thousand dollar day. So that'll be pretty exciting. So if tomorrow. My my streak continues, and we open up 20 points more. I'd be very, very happy if J-Nug ju jumps up 20 points tomorrow. Uh, Facebook. So Facebook had a run, and I missed it. It was like, wow. I mean, it, I missed it. it. It almost hit 290. So Facebook, I will tell you, if Facebook hits 272 again, I'm all in on Facebook. I think it would be great. And you play that out to 285. And I'm 285, 272 to 285. And... I would play it to 285, get out, and then wait for it to drop back down to 274, 275, play it again to 285, 87, drop it again. It'll, it's going to happen three times between now and the end of earnings, and as we start to get to earnings, it'll do it more, even more seriously. So I'm looking for 272, and I'm going to jump all over it. I think that would be a great, great, great play. Apple also moved. So I said Apple last week. I think it was last week or the week before I said to buy Apple at 112. So my alert – went off. It didn't go off because my because it never hit 112. It hit 112 and a half. And unfortunately that happens sometimes with my with the way I pick cuz there's no way there's no way you can actually like you know 112 is what I'm looking for. But 112.50 or 11260 is still 112 and I missed it because I set my alert for 112 and I didn't see it and sure enough it jumped to 122, which was right where I said it would go and sure enough I I didn't get in, but that's okay. It was still a good play. Uh, Christian, he's online right now, and he's saying that the Intel play that I told him to play. By the way, the stock option Sultan sends out text messages to the students about what to play. And sure enough, I sent out Intel a couple of weeks ago, and uh, Christian just got he made ninety percent. He made ninety percent on his play, and oh, you're out of fifty five. It's time to get out, Christian. If you're up ninety percent, get out. All right. So he made a lot of money on his play. I made about sixty or seventy percent on that play as well. I got out early. I got out last week, and I'm pretty excited. What are you and Phil that you really like? Uh, I was in Zoom last week. Oh, that was a good one, too. Yeah, yeah. I, I made a lot of money on that, yeah. uh, riding it up to earnings. The only mistake I made was I got out a little early because I got out at, like, I sold it at 418, right? I bought it at, like, 375, Oof. sold it at 418, Oof. 
and I almost passed out when I saw the stock made it to like four hundred and eighty. Yeah, but you what you make one hundred and fifty percent on that? I made a lot of money off. Yeah, of that's. Yeah. I'm sorry, but nobody ever went. Bro- nobody ever went broke taking a profit. I'm aware of and, that. And <laughs> certainly nobody ever went broke taking one hundred and fifty percent profit. So stop it. I'm I'm not complaining. I'm just <laughs> I'm saying, man, when I looked at it, I'm like, ah. Oh, I started crying like a baby. Oh, I don't cry. I look at that and go, wow, how cool is that? I move on. I mean, look at Tesla. Tesla's back in the 500s again, and Tesla's going to go to 1,000 again and, and double split again. I, I mean, I can't believe I, I can't believe that company. As a matter of fact, i got to tell you something. I'm really seriously considering buying a, a Model X. I think it's going to be a really cool car. I think it is a really cool car. Yeah, I think I think that's next on my list. You know, the payment is 2000 Yeah, you're a just going to have to sell a couple cars to make room for it. I sold the Mercedes. Did you? I did. Good for you. I know. I like, was just tired of it because I wasn't driving it. And it was sitting out in front of what the house. What about that hoopty outside? Is that yours? They got the hoopty outside, yeah. Is that the school's or is that yours? No, that's that's uh, that's actually owned by by uh, one of my other LLCs. Why don't you just dump that thing? Why don't you sell well, it? Well, because it doesn't cost me anything. I, I one paid leased it, and it just sits it sits there. It's a spare car. So it's a lease, and then you're just going to give it back in a couple yeah, of years. Yeah, just give it back in two years. So right. so I one paid leased that. I paid $9,000 for it for three years. Yeah. Okay. What do I care? Yeah. Okay. You know, uh, you know, so it just sits out there. It says I buy houses on it. I drive it around. I lend it to people when they need it. We had so we had uh, Jamie as an employee. She was driving it for a little while because her car was broken. You know, so so you know I've got some visitors that come in now and then. It might ever... actually behoove you to get someone else to drive it. Yeah, like, I agree. How about a young guy who right. could use doesn't y- just. Like Stone, for example, have him drive it around because if he's driving it, more people would see I it. I think it'd be great to have him park that car in your driveway so they see my number on the car instead of your number on your car. Yeah, like m- people are driving down my street, like hundreds of thousands of people to, to call <laughs> my car. I, I just think that if you have a car that's wrapped, right, why park it in a parking lot when you can have somebody driving it around? Like okay. I'd, I'd almost like re- release it to somebody else. Who would drive it? Yeah, right? I, I, th- I thought about that. Actually. Just have him drive it around. Yeah, I thought about that. It's like, fine. Whatever. Not, you maybe know. Stone's yeah. not even the right guy. You get yeah. somebody like uh, somebody who would actually drive a lot, right? And yeah, we also use it as a demo though for the school because the logo that's on that on that car, yeah, I know, is the logo we let the the, stu- the students of the school use. So we show them how we would wrap a car if you know if they wanted to wrap a car. So that's it. So we're going back to Phil. Guy, tell us talk to us about anything you want to talk about. Yeah, why don't we take a minute to tell you all the radio stations we're on? Let's do that. So of course we're on twelve ten a.m. Yes, WPHT twelve ten. We're on twelve ten a.m. PHT. Yeah. What station is that? You know what station that is. I know. Okay, so <laughs> it's Sunday at three o'clock and Saturdays at two o'clock. You can get us anytime you want. But we're also on 92.1 WVLT-FM, Sundays at 4 p.m. and Wednesdays at 10 p.m. And that runs in South Jersey, mostly in Vineland area. Okay? Then there's the 860 WWDBAM, the station run by the great Sam Spicer. That's Monday at 2 p.m. and Saturday at 2 p.m. in Philadelphia. And we're also on 1450 WCTCAM. Saturday at 9 a.m. in the morning in North Jersey and in Central Jersey. And we're also on 1250 WMTRAM, Saturdays 11 a.m. in North Jersey and Central Jersey. I want to tell everybody out there, uh, if you are in a business that could benefit from being around realtors, real estate agents, and real estate investors, you should think about advertising on the show, Investor Schooling Live. We might even let you come on as a guest and give you a whole segment to talk about your business. How about that? If you'd like to know more about that, email us, info at investorschooling.com, info at investorschooling.com. We also have a brokerage here, okay? 100% commission at the Investor Brokerage. And if you want to do some of these outside-the-box ideas that we talk about on this show, like using private money, like using trust, like buying properties with none of your own money, taking over people's loan payments, or even making the seller of the house be the note holder on a deal. We call that seller financing. Do you think you're going to be allowed to do that at some traditional, boring agency? Well, you're not. We're going to teach you how. We're now finished, and we'll see you next week. Investorschooling.com.